What's up guys, Doug Polk here and I'm back to Las Vegas, Nevada and it's been good, I had a good trip to California but we got a little business to get down to now that my trip's over. Over the last couple of weeks there have been a bunch of people that stepped up and taken some shots at me but I was on the road, didn't have good recording equipment, was busy and so I didn't really say much but now that's over, it's time to drop the hammer cause I'm back in town baby! For what? You're going to Philadelphia tomorrow. Oh shit. I am going to be headed tomorrow to Philadelphia to play on Poker Night in America and then commentate for Saturday and Sunday, culminating in the heads up match between Kate Hall and Mike Dentali. I'm excited to go over there and be part of it and it should be a pretty fun match. But anyway, we have a video to get to today. I'm only gonna to get to do one one back here in Vegas. So I decided to make it something a little bit different. Today we're gonna to talk about seven of the biggest misconceptions players have about poker or how to play poker and good strategy. Let's go ahead and jump into number one. The first misconception is if you call the flop, you have to at least see the river. That is completely not true and obviously better players know that, but it is something you see pretty often as a logic train. I saw a thread on Reddit just the other day where a player called pre-flop with a pseudo connector and they flopped open in a straight flush draw, so needless to say they should have put their chips in, but they folded and one of the comments said, well why fold, why even call a pre if you're going to fold this flop? And in general I don't like logic like that. It was a mistake for that player to fold, don't get me wrong, but you have to analyze each decision individually rather than looking at the whole thing. You know, sometimes in the flop you're going to call and you're not going to have many turns you improve on, but you still have to call or else you're going to fold too much facing a flop bet. Now just because you made a loose flop call facing aggression doesn't mean that you have to compound that mistake by playing the turn the same way. You can, you can just let your hand go and move on to play the next hand. You don't want to make two mistakes trying to defend your first shitty- wait, are we still- Seriously though, look at each street individually and play accordingly. Don't make your plan on the flop and then not care what the turn river are. Think about all your hands and make the right decision. Number two is thinking that past results have any effect on future results. What's happened in the past is done and now anything new is a new instance. Sometimes unlucky things can happen a bunch of times in a row or very lucky things can happen a bunch of times in a row. That doesn't mean the next hand means anything. I do sometimes think that players feel like if certain tournament players have won a few in a row that they're more likely to win more because they're on a hot streak. Or if someone three bets them a few times in a row, the next three bet they either have to have it or don't have to have it or whatever. All of these things are simply not true. Every individual instance is a percent chance for something to happen. You should view that accordingly. Now, if I did get three bet four times in a row, what I would be thinking facing that fourth four, four three bet is okay, this player three bets aggressively, not that it is a bluff or the last one wasn't or anything like that, but I would take a more aggressive stance facing that three bet rather than trying to do something in that particular hand. And a lot of times when we see, for example, in tournaments, a particular player just blow up and have a crazy hand, it's because they decide in that instant that their opponent does not have it and they're willing to go the distance to prove that. That's how you end up making really big mistakes in poker. And yeah, while sometimes it can win you a big pot, it oftentimes makes you have problems you wouldn't have otherwise and you should try to avoid it and look at every situation for what it is. Number three is thinking that the amount of money you've won over a certain time will continue to happen moving forward and basing your life around that. I hear it all the time, if I just play X amount of tables at Y win rate, I'm going to have Z amount of money and while that's great in your perfect little world, it oftentimes doesn't end up like that for a bunch of reasons. First off, your win rate changes constantly. Just because you had a few big blind win rate over 100k hands does not guarantee you the same win rate over the next 100k hands, things can change. Also, your ability changes with the amount of tables you play. Don't pretend playing 8 or 16 tables are the same thing, they're not, and realistically I think you should be aiming to play 6 tables or less to play your A game. 
Finally, the biggest problem with this is it makes you a worse player in the long run. You want to be thinking about poker and getting better and understanding things rather than just trying to battle your way through a bunch of hands to get that win rate to buy things or, or have a certain amount to invest or whatever. You want to be trying to actively pursue getting better at poker so in the future, you know, you can you can make more money and play even higher stakes. Now, there are some players that manage to do this at a really successful level. In fact, Nananoko, I remember back when I was coming up, Nananoko was the legend for grinding. I don't know how he did it, but he made it work and really managed to crush the games. Remember though, that is the exception, not the rule. So base your play around getting better and moving up rather than just trying to grind out X amount of dollars. His relentless work ethic and intense dedication have produced one of the most incredible graphs in online poker history. I fucking beast high stakes. I beast everything. Number four is the notion that if you're only going to play a game once, you don't have to have the proper bankroll to be able to play that game. I have seen countless times in my career a washed up tournament player putting their last dime they have back into the game, hoping to strike it big, but they don't. They end up busting and they never make it. Hey now. I've won two bracelets. They just happen to be in the least skillful events ever. Honestly though, I hear this all the time. It actually kind of drives me nuts because the kind of people that say, if you're only gonna play it once, you don't have to have the full bankroll for it, are usually people that end up doing it multiple times. You know, in the grand scheme of things, if you did take one shot one time in your life under rolled, it would not be that bad of a situation. But the problem is the overall thinking that it leads you towards. If it's okay now, why isn't it okay later? Why isn't it okay after that? Is it okay next year? Probably, right? You're doing it this year. And so the problem becomes you constantly end up taking these under rolled shots. In general, it's good to stick some pretty disciplined bankroll management on yourself, and then if you need to sell action, have a network of players that you can sell to. That way, you don't have to base whether you can play or not totally on the buy-in. You can pick your own stakes that you're comfortable with and do it the right way. Don't think you're going to take huge shots and get lucky. That's not the way that it works for most people. Now, I will also say you should look at the, the tournament itself. If it's a great tournament with no rake, then yeah, take a bigger piece than in a heavy rake, you know, less skillful event. But the point is based on those factors and not just taking a shot because it's only this one time thing. I kind of think it's stupid to do this. And a lot of people do, a lot of regs do. But what kind of reg would it be that would do that? That reg losing player. Oh, thanks, Jason. Number five is thinking that short-term results are significant when understanding your true win rate. Now, in tournaments, okay, it's better to look at a few tournaments results than no tournaments, but really, it isn't that much. In one event, almost anything can happen, and I think the best example of that is the World Series of Poker main event. Now, yes, oftentimes the cream does rise to the top, and we have main event winners like Scotty Wynn, Jerry Yang, and of course, Jamie Gold, but oftentimes that doesn't happen. In tournaments, it is an insanely luck-based type of game. Still skill, of course, applies, and the better players win in the end. But when you look at massive field tournaments, luck is going to play a huge and decisive role in who actually wins. So don't put too much stock into individual tournaments, and make sure to think about all of the events someone has played or you've played when you're calculating out your return on investment and understanding how good you are in terms of all of the players playing the game. Number six is thinking that you're going to keep winning at the rate you've been winning before. And this applies to both cash game players and tournament players. I see both of them think that what they've won at over the last week or month or two months is going to continue for forever. And then they have spending habits that don't match what their actual income ends up being. Don't think that just because you had a big score in a tournament or a great month at the cash tables, that's going to go on like that forever because it's not. The way variance works is you have good you have good upswings and you're going to have bad downswings and don't let the short-term fluctuation fool you. If you do not spend your money wisely and you blow it on random things like partying or cars or whatever, then you're not going to put yourself in a good situation down the road. So try to look at your income more in terms of an average over a long period of time rather than just a short-term fluctuation. Now, when you do have a big score, I think it's totally fine to buy yourself something nice to celebrate, but remember to try and put as much of that money into investing and, and holding on for future tournaments as you can so that down the road, you put yourself in a good position to make even more money. 
Number seven are people thinking that playing a GTO type strategy will not win them very much money. For starters, no one is currently playing quote GTO because no one has solved the game. People are playing styles based off of game theory elements. Now, for some reason, there's some confusion going on that if you don't play a theoretical style and look to exploit players, that you're going to win a lot of money. And if you play a theory-based style, you might win like a little bit. You won't lose, but you're barely going to win. That is simply not true because poker is a very complex game and the solutions are often hard to understand. In fact, we don't truly know them because we're still learning about the game of No Limit Hold'em. So if you play a style of poker that has a good theoretical, a good theoretically sound strategy, then you're going to win a lot over the long run, not just small because you aren't exploiting your opponent. If you play a good strategy in poker, it's going to allow you to win the most pots possible. And we talked about this a bit in the YouTube video I did uh, called How I Won Millions of Dollars Playing Poker. And if you want to check out more about it in that video, you could do so. But the thing, the bottom line is this. If you play a good sound strategy, you're going to crush your opponents, particularly in weaker games. What I do feel is that people talk about exploitative play, thinking that it makes it okay for them not to study or balance or learn, and they use it as a crutch to defend what they're doing. Sometimes you make mistakes in poker and that's fine, you should learn from them, but basing individual hands off of whether it was good or bad because it's exploitative is just frankly kind of stupid. If you're playing a, a, a theoretically based strategy, you're going to win the long run if your strategy is sound. Now, I'm not taking away from exploitative play. You can obviously exploit people to make money, and lots of people do, but the thing is, you're playing a game there where if you're wrong, your opponent can beat you. I prefer to not play games like that. I try and do my best version of a theoretically sound strategy and then maybe make some small adjustments along the edges to try and counter my opponent. Now, hopefully we can put all of that to rest because if Alec Turley makes a single another GTO video, I don't even know what I'm going to do right now. A lot of the time, I will have the best hand. And most of the time, a lot of the time, the best hand. Most of the time, but definitely have the best hand a good amount of the time. All in all, there are many fallacies, not just in poker, but in the world of gambling as a whole. And that's one of the reasons why there's so much bad information out there. Another reason is that if people said the good information and it got out, well, then everyone would get better and then it would make the game tougher to beat. When you're listening to someone or you hear some advice, Think about if it really makes sense within what your strategy is and if you want to put it into your game or put it into the way you're managing your money or the way you think about poker. At the end of the day, you have to decide what makes sense and sometimes going off the beaten path can be the way to make it to the top. Thank you for joining me for today's video. As always, hit that sub button. I'm not sure if I'm going to have a video tomorrow, but I will shortly, so stay tuned.